All right, question creation. So we are now up to the point where we've selected our interviewees and we have had previous thoughts on what sort of gaps they can help fill. We are now going to translate that into what it will look like as an interview guide. And an interview guide is essentially a full set of questions for a specific interviewee. There's going to be some basic biographical data typically at the top, and that's to help you as the question creator, but also you as the whole history interviewer to help have a snapshot sense of who it is in front of you, what the context is of their life experiences, and how they may be able to help answer the questions moving forward, as well as any follow-up questions you may have. And then consider each interviewee and how their story helps to support the topics of focus. So some of our questions may be similar and have overlaps. You can see a through line in that particular topic of focus. And other areas, we're going to want to ask more specific questions for that particular interviewee. So having a chance to consider what are the broad but also very specific questions we want to ask our interviewees with our question or focus in mind. I want you to keep in mind for question creation that we want to make sure all of our questions are open ended. And that means that we're not asking questions that could be answered by yes, no, or maybe. Open ended questions are also a great way to get that person's particular sense or recollection versus asking them for a factual answer. The next part that I would like you to keep in mind and that I often see overlooked is context setting. When we're asking questions, and especially when we're wanting interviewees to open up, it is sometimes helpful to, in our question, acknowledge the context upfront of whatever it is that we're asking. For example, when I am speaking with somebody and there's a particular event they were in or a particular accomplishment that they've had, I will use part of that context or that question set up to say, okay, Jim, when you were experiencing this event in the 1960s, you're around 13 years old and we know from the last question that you experienced some of this. Could you tell me some more about that or how did that feel? So helping Jim in my imaginary scenario with some context of how old he was, what event I'm looking for, what years, and that I'm looking for his thoughts, feelings, and recollections about that specific thing versus asking him to just tell me about that event. The difference between those two questions are the first one very much centers his experience and his story, his memory, whereas the second one is something that I could plug into a Google search and get this like a, an answer for. It would not be Jim's answer because it would not be Jim's experience or memory, but it would be the answer to what that event was about. And then, of course, the follow up questions. So sometimes when we're question creating, we know that there will likely be a follow up and may include it as part of that, like a two parter kind of question. Other times though, there's natural follow-ups that come up based on what the interviewee has said to us previously. If there are follow-up questions that you would like to continue going down the trail of, that's definitely something I encourage. Uh, other times though, there may be a follow-up question where depending on how long the interview has already gone or what the focus of your interview is, it may not be appropriate or it may not be um, good manners to ask some of the follow up questions. For example, some of the rookie mistakes that I tend to see happen here in the follow up questions is that instead of keeping the topic of focus in mind for your interview, there may have been something that came up that may seem like interesting, but in like an interpersonal or perhaps gossipy kind of way, or perhaps just extremely personal. And if it has nothing to do with that particular focus, you have no business asking about it. So please keep that in mind. That is a, a marker of professionalism. And it's one thing that just like, I do not like because it, it really does um, not only 
sort of stain what it is the work that you're doing but it could also severely insult or hurt the person you're asking these questions of so just please be incredibly mindful that your follow-ups are topic appropriate okay question flow so there's creating the questions there's leaving some room for uh, follow-up questions or naturally flowing into a a different topic. I want us to also think about the question flow and how to set it up in the best way so that you're not hopping around question wise or topic wise and it can seem more natural and more comfortable both to you as the interviewer but also to the interviewee. So when we're putting these questions together, the opening questions are going to be one to two questions that are meant to get some information but also these questions job is to help warm up and help make the interviewee feel as comfortable as possible they're going to usually be very nervous and sometimes very intimidated by the process they're about to go through so asking them some warm uh, opening questions uh, seemingly simple but something that they could really wax poetic about if they want to something to get them excited, something to get them warmed up, help them feel comfortable with you, as well as the topic what they're about to talk about. Also then getting into, there's the, the warm up opening question, getting into some beginning questions. And when I typically work on an interview flow, I start with beginning questions that help to set the scene. So what are some of the historical events we're gonna be talking about? What are some of the first experiences I want us to touch on because we're going to get into detail of those things later. So putting those towards these not opening questions, but very beginning early questions. As you move your way through, sometimes it makes sense to go into more detail of particular items. Other times it makes sense to start moving towards broader questions. What are the broader implications of what we just talked about the particular event or the particular person? and then lead in our way towards these ending questions. So now that we've gone through this flow of conversation of a particular event or recollection, what are some ending questions to help bring some finality or some perspective from the interviewee that is specific to them, but on the topics that you've been talking about? And then for the closing questions, we usually have one or two in there that help to bring closure and again bring in hopefully a bit of that lightheartedness that that comfort and reassurance to the interviewee that they have done a good job that we're just about done here and we even in our particular work that we do with oral history interviews will include a question that we preface with okay that was the end of our formal questions the questions we've prepared for you today is there anything that we didn't ask that we should have? Or is there anything that you'd like to share with us? And sometimes there's not. Sometimes the interview was incredibly thorough. The interviewee is feeling very comfortable and confident with the answers that they've given. But a good other 50% of the time, if not more, the interviewee realizes that it's the end of the interview. There's a bit of relief, but also that's when things tend to come to mind of like, oh, I want to make sure we mention this before we're done. So uh, sort of capturing and sort of triggering that moment with them so that you can make sure you've captured everything before you're on your way out the door and they're trying to tell you about things that you really wish you would have recorded with them before you were done. Okay, focusing back in on ethics for this particular section and prioritizing the well-being of the interviewee. This particular portion is incredibly important from my perspective and is covered in some of the literature, but in my opinion, not nearly enough or as as prioritized. So we're going to spend a couple minutes here with the ethics. Oral historians, at least traditionally, tended not to send out their questions ahead of time. This was mostly due down to strategy. If you were to send the questions ahead of time, usually people like to do their homework and write out their answers 
and you lose some of that spontaneity or that natural storytelling. So stylistically, it's something that oral historians want to avoid because they want the more natural storytelling. However, with the oral history interviews that we are doing and certainly moving forward as we're trying to fill in historical gaps and working with communities that have been uh, mistreated past and present or and or have trauma around the particular topics and in the community we need to be incredibly careful and center their sense of safety and well-being and this is where sending questions ahead of time is the ethical thing to do and is something where I have switched my practice to if, if we are working with these types of communities, if there is any chance that there may be some trauma around things, I am sending questions ahead of time so that there are no surprises. So that the interviewees that we're working with have a chance to think about those questions and if they want to answer them. It gives them time to connect with their therapist if they are working with a mental health professional. And it gives them a chance to communicate to us as the interviewers what they are comfortable answering or not. And it gives us a chance to change the questions if we need to. What I have found so far is that usually there's not a lot of question changing or taking away but that it has given our interviewees the benefit of getting some support ahead of time on answering some of these questions that may not seem like tough questions on paper, but come with incredibly tough emotions and recollections. So that is a, a major, this is why we send questions ahead of time. It also helps in these other facets. So anyone who may need a memory aid, so thinking of some of our interviewees who are more advanced in age or who may be experiencing some neuro um, atypicalness. And so having that ability to have that memory prompt and get a little bit more comfortable with the questions ahead of time can make all the difference with their sense of confidence and comfort. Also from an accessibility perspective, those who may need access to the questions ahead of time in a non-auditory form, it gives them a chance to get the tools they need to, to have in place for us to have this conversation together. And then for our last point, which I know we started with at the beginning of this slide, but just to reiterate, those who may have trauma and need to emotionally prepare or make the decision not to include the question. So several reasons as to why providing the questions ahead of time is part of our ethics of care. <laughs>